everyone. Welcome to the Coincidence Problem. This is a piece that I wrote. My name is Cassia Streb, and the text you're going to hear is written by Stephen Osborne. You can find out more about him at geist.com. There are three mini pieces happening concurrently with Steve's speech. You'll hear a percussion duo, a sustained pitch quartet, and a vocal duo. And at sometimes you might hear silence, and that's totally fine. The piece is structured in that way, and there is a lot of silence, so don't be afraid if you're hearing nothing. And without further ado, we're going to start. The Coincidence Problem I was walking down the street thinking about a friend I hadn't seen for some time, and when I looked up there was my friend standing at the corner with his wife, and he was looking at me in some surprise, for as it turned out they had been speaking of me in the same moment that I had been thinking of them. And so we congratulated ourselves on having arrived there at the corner at just the right moment for these facts to be revealed to us. We talked for a while in some excitement, as many things came to mind that we had probably been meaning to discuss were we ever to run into each other precisely as we had just done. And we parted with the happy sense that the moment of our meeting had been a gift, that we had been singled out by it. Later I recalled that none of us had referred to our fortunate encounter as a coincidence, perhaps because coincidence is a word that we have learned to distrust, a term of derogation employed by parents, teachers, and other grown-ups, by which I mean people who call themselves realists, to dismiss the marvelous. How often have we heard the words, it's only a coincidence, to discount events like the unexpected encounter of friends who are thinking of each other. For there is something in the culture that disdains the serendipitous, that wishes to strip it of significance. The real world is understood to be a world of non-coincidence, a world in which events are held accountable to an iron rule of cause and effect. term of derogation employed by parents, teachers, and other grown-ups. What this rationalist view fails to understand is that coincidence requires perception in order to exist at all. It is a function of our looking at the world. If my friends and I had not seen each other, there would have been no event. This is perhaps what troubles the rational minds of grown-ups, who believe an event has to be an event, whether or not it was perceived by someone to be an event in the first place. Reality, in this view, is a system of crude levers and pulleys interacting to produce acceptably non-coincidental events in an orderly fashion. We are reduced in this view to the status of mere observers, and our experience of the world becomes an empty fantasy. Last year, a young man who had been a student of mine 
sent me a note to say that he had been driving with friends along the Trans-Canada Highway on Canada Day, and as the car approached the turnoff to the Fraser Canyon, he began telling his friends a story that I had written about leaving the city in an old Toyota and driving through the Fraser Canyon. term of derogation employed by parents, teachers, and other grown-ups. Uh. And as he was telling the story, so he wrote, he looked out the window and saw an old Toyota chugging along in the right-hand lane. And then he saw that the driver was me, his old teacher, driving into the canyon that I had written about in the story that he was telling to his friends at that moment. There he is now, he said to his friends. That's the man I'm talking about. And he became quite excited. But already the Toyota had taken the turn off, and the young man who had been my student, and who was now giddy with excitement, was unable to convince his friends that the man in the Toyota had indeed been me. When I received his note, I was able to confirm that I had made a trip through the canyon on that day, which was Canada Day, and that had I looked over my shoulder before taking the turn off, I would have seen my ex-student looking back at me. And then briefly I felt what it might be like to be observed inside one of my own narratives. Is this perhaps as close as I can come to meeting myself in passing? I had made a trip through the canyon on that day. Two words, but big business as mere coincidence. Not, not. of derogation employed by parents, teachers, and other grown-ups. Even at this remove from the event, which could not be said to have happened to me, I did not look up. I could feel the thrill that coincidence always offers. It made me smile. I was uplifted by news of it. Every coincidence brings with it the question of what if. What if I had turned away before seeing my friend in the street? What if my ex-student had not looked out the window? What if I had looked up and seen him? These are questions that children like to ask, and they reflect the tantalizing sense of wonder that coincidence invokes. We are reminded of the always proliferating universe of the possible.
On another day, I was trying to write about British Israelites, a now obscure sect whose followers believed Anglo-Saxons to be descended from the lost tribes of Israel. And I was getting nowhere with my story. I left my desk and went for a walk along an unfamiliar stretch of avenue occupied by grocery stores and restaurants and electronic shops, and became lost in thought. When I looked up, I was standing outside an aging storefront, in the window of which hung a map of Europe and North Africa, beneath a large red sign identifying the shop as the British Israelite World Federation Bookstore, probably the only bookstore of its kind, as I would later discover, remaining in the world. spirit of wonder. The proprietor was a red-haired man with a beard who was pleased to fill me in on the present state of the British Israelite movement, which he said was still alive in certain circles. I could not bring myself to tell him of the unlikelihood of our meeting, which seemed to him to be quite natural. After all, where would anyone interested in the subject of the British Israelites be more likely to show up? He showed me a pamphlet containing a speech given by a local scholar convinced that the roots of the Shinto religion of Japan lay in the Israel of the Old Testament, a thesis that is now lost to history, and that, according to the title page, had been given to the public at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the Oak Room of the Hotel Vancouver on the 28th of March, 1932. I bought the pamphlet for $2, and as I walked home, I felt ludicrously like Coleridge's dreamer, who awakens to find the flower that he had been dreaming of clenched in his hand. For I was returning from a dreamlike event, and I too carried a souvenir. Coincidence is the woof and the warp of dreams. Events and dreams occur willy-nilly by juxtaposition and seem to defy the system of cause and effect. That dreamlike quality may be what makes a coincidence so difficult for the rationalist to accept. A coincidence is always ludicrous. It makes us feel laughable. In a moment of coincidence, the world seems to be mocking us. Indeed, at these moments, we feel that we are being seen by the world, that we are observed. We become vulnerable. Our very perception of coincidence entangles us in the world. We are caught off guard. We are engaged. In these moments, the world seems to have turned around and to be looking right at us. And so we speak with caution about coincidence. Wittgenstein avoided the word entirely by speaking of concomitance instead.
How many times have events like the ones I speak of been dispelled from the real world by being dismissed as mere coincidence? Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio brush off a marvelous coincidence in his own life as being but the product of random chance, as he put it. And he seemed even to be apologizing as he said it. But what we want to ask him would constitute a non-random chance. Did he mean to say that the meaningful can exist only in a world of intended or predictable occurrences? What would constitute an acceptably non-coincidental, yet still marvelous event that he would not have to apologize for? Three dictionaries within my reach define coincidence as events apparently accidental, happening without apparent causal connection, and apparently by mere chance. A fourth dictionary is even more skittish. An event that might have been arranged, although it was really accidental. All of these definitions seem to be saying that coincidence cannot be defined because it only appears to be what it is, whatever that is. Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio. I had been a Wittgenstein avoided Wittgenstein entirely by speaking of concomitants. Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio. None of this helps us understand what non coincidence must be or must, as the lexicographers put it, apparently be. Coincidence invokes the specter of cause and effect, and at the same time reminds us that the, of the photon that exists as a wave or a particle, depending on how you look at it. Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio and other grown who awakens to find the flower. Wittgenstein avoided the word entirely by speaking of concomitants instead. Moments of coincidence tend to immerse us in the world. The present moment is enlarged by coincidence, made expansive. We glimpse in coincidence the concealed contents of a much vaster present than we had suspected to be lurking there. But then we are told that it is all in one's mind, as if one's mind were not in the world and of the world, as if we were not body, mind, and soul entangled in the larger world of wind and weather, of atoms and molecules, as if the stuff of our being were not of the world, and the world not of our being. Perhaps behind a fear of coincidence lies a distaste for the unpredictable, passed down to us from the age of Newton. But unpredictability is not incompatible with the law of cause and effect. Coincidence is made marvelous precisely because cause and effect is the mode of its coming into being. Here perhaps we approach the heart of the matter. The rules merely define a system. Of themselves, they cause nothing. Coincidence is a ripple in the tangled blur of cause and effect that we see when we look out at the world. At the moment of coincidence, the world looks back at us. We are perceived by the world in the embrace of our own perception. In such a moment, everything is changed, but nothing is different. Perhaps this is why there are no monuments to coincidence. 
Although coincidence informs the life of each of us. Coincidence is made marvelous precisely because cause and effect who is the mode of its coming into being. I had made a trip. Coincidence is made marvelous precisely because cause and effect not is long the mode of its coming into radio. In the fall, I met friends from out of town in a downtown bar and told them stories of an old mentor who had been an important influence in my life. The music in the bar had become funereal, and when we asked the bartender why, he shrugged and made an unfunny joke about funeral parlors. The music in the bar had become funereal. Who awakens to find the flower? Wittgenstein avoided the word entirely by term of derogation employed by parents, teachers, and other grown-ups. Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio. Coincidence is made marvelous precisely because cause and effect is made the mode of its coming because cause and effect is the mode of its coming into being. When I got home, I picked up a magazine from the stack in the bathroom, and it fell open at a poem written in memory of the man I had been telling stories about, my old mentor, and I understood at that moment that he was no longer alive. The magazine was six months old. The poem, written by his daughter, would be how much older than that? I lit a candle to honor the man whom I had revered but had not seen since 1986. He had been a curator and an art critic before moving to the Ottawa Valley yes. to become an antiquarian bookie, and he was a writer of some power. We all laughed at the photograph of the surrealist insulting the priest, he wrote in a poem in 1974, and I copied the line into my journal. A few he once gave me a 1958 Pontiac in return for some small favor. I drove it for six months and sold it for a dollar in the Cecil beer parlor when I didn't need it anymore.
That was the summer I used to go to the racetrack with my brother, to place bets on the advice of an astrologer who had worked out a way of predicting winners based on the positions of the planets and the timing of the starting gun. It took a few weeks to adapt to the system, and when we were ready and had chosen our day, the astrologer calculated that the first race, if it started on time, would bring in horses six and three, which, as I recall, were controlled by Mars and Mercury. And after that, the following races would come in like clockwork. Astrology is the most deterministic of the prognosticating arts, a clear expression of the levers and pulleys theory of reality. My brother and I set out in the Pontiac with our charts and my girlfriend, who became unpleasantly negative as we drove across the city, and eventually I had to pull over and ask her to get out of the car. She had no money, so I gave her cab fare from our betting fund. A few blocks from the track, the Pontiac ran out of gas, and we had to push it into a gas station and pour a few gallons into the tank. When we got to the track, the parking lot was full, so we drove back onto the street to park, and then had to run back to the gate to pay the entrance fee. We were within a few feet of the betting window when the bell rang and the race went off before we could place our bets. Mars and Mercury came in just as they were supposed to, we could see then that the system seemed to work, but we couldn't see that it didn't seem to work for us. We followed up the consequences of the first race, as my astrologer friend had directed us, and broke even in the second and third races. It took a few weeks to adapt to the system. Wittgenstein, not long ago, I heard a man on the radio. Not long ago, I heard a man on the radio. The music in the bar had become funereal. was to be a big one with Mars, and Mars and Mercury would play a part in it. My brother took our money to the wicket to bet on six and three both ways. I looked out at the track as the horses came up to the post. Among them was a white stallion, a rare sight at the races, and it carried the number four on its back. Four was the number of the moon, which according to our advisor always played a role in the fourth race. It was also an extreme long shot. I looked out to the east where the moon, nearly full, could be seen hanging in a blue sky. I was caught up by the moment and felt a shiver in the back of my neck. I said to myself, white horse, white moon, four in the fourth race. And then I said, it's only coincidence. And manfully, rationally, resisted the impulse to call my brother back and change the bet. I was the eldest, and perhaps the more addicted to the unbending lever of logic. The white stallion won the race handily, separated from the pack by six and three, who seemed to be running interference for it, and my brother and I failed to win hundreds of dollars. Four was the number of the moon. What the experience of the world is not reality. Wittgenstein avoided the word entirely by white or concomitants white moon. It took a few weeks term of derogation employed by Pesetsis and teachers of white motives. Coincidence is made marvelous precisely as cause of them is the mode of its coming. What the experience of the world is not reality at all. Thirty years later, I read in a layman's book on quantum mechanics that what we experience of the world is not reality at all, but our interaction with reality. And that is the end of the coincidence problem.
Thanks very much. You've been listening to The Coincidence Problem with text and narration by Stephen Osborne. We had Jessica Basta and Andrea Young as vocalists. Percussionists are Lewis Keller and Daniel Corral. Our sustaining pitch quartet is April Guthrie on cello, Harish Kumar on double bass, Phil O'Connor on bass clarinet, and Jonathan Staney on contrabassoon. Um, technical direction by Thaddeus Fraser-Reed, technical support by Laura Laham, and the camera operator is Caitlin Cowie. I'm Cassius Streb, the composer, and please tune in next time. <laughs>